Welcome, and we will indeed start with our bracha. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kitshanu B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu L'asot B'divrei Torah. Amen. And uh, <clears throat> let's make sure I'm in the place. Yes. So we start a new, of course, Pasha this week, and that's the Pasha of Shmini. And the Shmini refers to the eighth day of this inauguration of Aaron and his sons into the priesthood. And essentially, the Parsha is divided into two parts. The first part, which is in fact the completion of the inauguration ceremony, and also involves, we talked about this actually in our previous sessions, they are recorded, they are on my uh, YouTube site. If you simply um, do a search for Shmini, S-H apostrophe M-I-N-I, you'll find the earlier, the earlier recordings because we're gonna continue on. Uh, and we're gonna continue with the inauguration. The second part, major part of this parsha has to do with laws of kashrut, has to do with what animals are kosher, uh, birds, uh, insects, etc., and of course, uh, animals being basically cattle, sheep, and uh, goats, and that's it in terms of uh, animals. So here we go uh, with the screen share. Well, there we are. It's just taking its time. For some reason, my computer seems very slow. I don't know why, but it is. I may need to restart it. There's something slowing it down. So here we are. Um, let's make sure we're down. Here we are from last week. Uh, so Moses is in the process now of bringing these animals. I made a list of the animals here because right at the beginning of the parsha, Aaron is told this is Aaron has to bring a calf for sin offering. And here again, we're going to be making reference to the golden calf, right? A ram as an ola, that's a whole offering. And then on behalf of the children of Israel, they're to bring a goat for a sin offering, a calf and a lamb for olot. So notice the order, right? Sin offering and ola, and, and then uh, an ox and a ram for shlamim sacrifices. And those tend to be sacrifices of thanksgiving and acknowledgement. So we start with atonement, right? And this, of course, in Allah, just to remind you, is an atonement for um, not performing positive commandments. And then uh, there's also, in addition, a meal offering that's brought along with us. This is all representing the children of Israel, right? So these are all public, public sacrifices, except the ones for Aaron, who is of course now going to become the high priest. So we're going to continue here with Moses at this point is I believe uh, bringing the offerings on behalf of the children of Israel. Vaikarev et mincha et hamincha. So we've already done a bunch of them, right? So here we go. Uh, he brought the meal offering. Vayimale kapo mimena. Uh, he filled his hand from it. Uh, that is, of course, that fistful that we talked about. Vayakter al hamizbeach. And he caused it to smoke on the altar. Milvad olat haboker apart from the Ola sacrifice of the morning. Now, nothing has been mentioned in the Parsha so far about Ola Taboker, but we know back, I believe, in Exodus, uh, they're commanded to bring a lamb in the morning and a lamb in the evening on a daily basis when they dedicated the sanctuary. So it's, it's there that we realize that there is, this is the tamid offering that is brought every single day. Uh, every single day, meaning including Shabbat and uh, hot festivals. Let's take a look. I believe there's a Rashi on this. So this is a whole different one. Let's see here. Nope. 
not on that page, but I think right here. Yeah. Via male kapo. He took, he filled his 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 palm. He ha kmitsa. We're referring here to the kmitsa. That is that pinch, so to speak, that special kind of pinch of the flower um, and and the oil that he would do. Nilvad olat haboker apart from the Ola of the morning, and he says, Kol Ela Asa, he did all of these, Achar Ola Tatamid, after the Ola of the morning had been brought, the Tamid, the tamid Ola had been brought. And the way the, the way the sacrifices took place is they were bracketed by the Ola of the morning, that was the very first offering of the morning and the olat mincha that would be the afternoon the evening sacrifice that tamid offering of the evening and then all the other sacrifices would be within those two uh, perpetual offerings uh et uh, shor the et ha so here we go he slaughtered the ox and the ram Zevach Hashlamim, the uh, sacrifice of peace offerings, the Shlamim sacrifice, Asher La'am, which represented the people, right? And that's here, right here, number six and seven, Shlamim, right? I've noticed, by the way, seven animals all together in this particular uh, um, ceremony, right? And the sons of Aaron passed over the blood to him. They obviously had it in a bowl. They would receive this blood when the animal was slaughtered into a bowl. They'd keep stirring the blood to make sure it didn't coagulate. And then they would pass it on to the priest, in this case, Aaron, who would then apply the blood to the altar. Vayizra kehu al hamizbeach saviv, and he cast it on the altar around. Remember that northwest corner and that southeast corner. So Aaron had to do that. Uh, let me see. Okay, on on to another verse. The et hachalavim min hashor, and the fat parts right from the ox. Umin ha'ail and from the ram, ha'alya. This is the fat tail that only would have belonged to members of the sheep family. So obviously that belonged to the ram. Vahamechase vahaklayot. Okay, uh, and that which covered, and the kidneys, and the lobe of the liver. So let's take a look. There's no, there's no Rashi on. Oh, here it is. Vaha mechase. So he's clearly, this vaha mechase is missing something. So literally we translated the fat tail and the thing that covered and the kidneys. So Hirashi takes this vaha mechase because it's a little bit of a difficulty here. He says what it really stands for. It's simply an elision. It says, He says, this is referring to the fat that covered, uh, I believe, the entrails here. So, uh, um, yeah. So this is uh, the, this is mentioned elsewhere. And that we've, we've actually read these kinds of things before in, in last week. Vayasimu et hachalavim al hechazot, and they placed those fat parts on the breasts, the brisket of the animals. Okay, and just to continue, vayakter hachalavim hamizbecha, and they caused the fat parts to smoke on the altar. They placed the, those fat parts on the breasts, on the chests of the, the part of the animal, the brisket. Uh, 
So even though it's not mentioned here, this would happen after they were waived. So they would take the, this is mentioned, these are mentioned elsewhere, where the, these are this sort of like a, a formal presentation of taking the fat and this particular part of the animal and lifting it up and down and to all four, four um, directions, north, south, east, west, or north, north, uh, west, east, and south, south uh, however, whatever direction he started with. But the point was, I mean, this wave offering in a way was acknowledgement, I believe, you know, somehow presenting it to God symbolically, and of course, God being present everywhere. So, uh, so after this waving, Netanan Kohen, so he's saying just in general, the Kohen would, Hamanif, who would actually do the Tnufa, who did the waving, he would give them, the Kohen would then give them the Kohen to a Kohen, to a priest, Acher, to another priest, Lahakti Ram, to cause them to smoke on the altar. There were actually three priests involved in all of this. Uh, right now, Marchi is mentioning two priests, right? Nimtsu ha'elyonim lamata. So originally the fat was put on the meat, and then as the priest handed it to the uh, to the other priest, he then would uh, he, he then would flip it over so that it could um, um, okay. so that it could uh, uh, smoke on the fat parts would then smoke on the altar. And so the bread. How, how, how is yeah. this different than um, uh, or similar to uh, shaking the lulav? Oh, um, well, it, it isn't. I mean, in some ways it is similar because likewise, when we shake the lulav in these various different directions, it's an acknowledgement of God's spirit being everywhere. And what we're trying to do is by holding that lulav and shaking it, being, you know, the lulav sort of acts as a, a transfer, right, to us uh, of the divine presence. The various parts of the lulav, uh, there are verses that all refer to God being present in these various different species, in the four species. And of course, the fact that there are four species represents the four letters of the divine name, etc. But it's a way of trying to focus our attention and our hearts to the divine presence. And that us shaking is as if, you know, it's in a way saying how God animates us. You know, we would be nothing. We'd be lumps of clay. And not even that, were it not for the fact that we are divinely animated. You could almost say our very conscious, you know, we can't, we can't explain our consciousness. This is all coming from a divine source. So good point, Judith, uh, that it's in that way, it's reminiscent of it, even though we no longer can practice these particular practices. So uh, going back over this verse again. So now we've got, you know, the fat of the of, of that of what was waved was put on the altar course to smoke, and now separate separated off the the brisket. <clears throat> Shok hayamin would be the right thigh of the animal. Nif aharon nufa again. So it's done. It looks like a second time that Aaron would uh, would. A wave, right? As a wave offering, lifnei Hashem before Hashem, kasher tziva Moshe, just as Moses had commanded. Vayisa Aaron et yadav. Then Aaron lifted up his hands, el ha'am, towards the people, vayevarchem, and he blessed them. Vayered me'asot hachatat, and he came down, came down from performing the sin offering, the haola, and the ola offering, the hashlamim, and the shlamim offering. So he did all of those things on the altar. The Torah is trying to give us a way to visualize what was going on there. 
is a Rashi for us to look at. What blessing? He blessed them. Doesn't say what. And this is Rashi tells us, Birkat Kohanim, Yevarechacha, Ya'er, and Yisa. <coughs> Excuse me, so sorry. So the threefold priestly benediction. Vayered me'al hamizbech, and he went down. What did he come down from? He came from off the altar. Remember, the altar was quite high, and he went up a ramp to be on the altar, so he came down from the ramp. Vayavu Moshe v'Aaron el ohel mo'ed, and Moses and Aaron went into the, came into the tent of meeting. Vayetsu, and then they came out. Vayivarachu et ha'am, and they blessed the people, and the glory of Hashem will be appeared to the entire nation. So this is really, so in other words, this was accomplished, okay? What, what they were hoping to accomplish was in fact accomplished. It's one thing to give a gift. I think sometimes we forget this. It's one thing for us to give a gift. It's another thing for the gift to be received and how the gift is received. So it's, it's a transaction. So the long Rashi on this, which is actually very interesting. So Moses and Aaron came. Okay, so why did they go into the tent of meeting? They went into it. Matsati the Parshat Miluim, I found, this is Rashi speaking personally to us, right? He says, I found in the chapter regarding the Miluim, right? The ordination, um, the inauguration of Aaron and his sons into the priesthood. The Baraita in a Baraita. A Baraita is an early source uh, that is contemporary with the Mishnah. The Mishnah was redacted in the year 200. So this is a source that would be earlier than the year 200. The word Baraita itself means outside. And that refers to the source being outside the Mishnah, not found in the Mishnah itself, which of course is a collection of various laws uh, that, as I said, of the oral tradition. Hanosfot al Torat Kohanim, which were in addition to the Sif, uh, the Sif, uh, Sifre, a uh, Sifra, excuse me, the Sifra. That's this halachic uh, midrash on the book of Leviticus, Shelanu of ours. So he found an additional source besides the Sifra. Lama nichnas Moshe im Aharon. Why did Moses enter with Aaron? to teach him how he was to perform the incense offering. And of course, the incense altar was inside the tent of meeting. And so he had to take Aaron into the tent of meeting to instruct him how to perform the incense sacrifice. And then the Midrash, this Midrash kind of typically uh, asks the opposite in order to prove what they're saying, right? Well, perhaps we might argue that he didn't go in uh, just to speak to him. Maybe that's all that he went into the tent of meeting to, to, to talk to his brother. Uh, or for another reason. Sorry, I don't have this pointed, so... So it's not Ledaber, but Ledavaracher. He went in to the tent of meeting with Aaron for some other purpose. Hareini Dan. Okay, so this is the way I'm going to argue. Is what this is. I'm translating this literally. This is how I'm going to argue. Yerida Uvia. Okay, that the coming down, right? Uvia and the coming down and the coming to Unot Bracha. They all require a blessing. I'm assuming Rida, he means coming down from the altar, Uvia, and he says going into the tent of meeting, all required uh, a blessing. Ma Yerida, so just 
as coming down from the altar. Me'en avodah had to do with the service that went on, right, on the altar. Af bi'ah, so likewise, the coming into the tent of meeting. In other words, they're connected. Me'en avodah has to be some kind of service. Halamarata, and from this you can de deduct, uh, deduce, lama nichnas Moshe im Aharon, why did not Moses go in, in with Aaron? Lelamdo alma sehaktoret, to teach him how the offering of the katoret was to be performed. So, in other words, the, the, this is one of the traditional ways in which scripture is interpreted, uh, smichut, in other words, the fact that the one is connected, the one subject is directly connected to the other subject and saying not only are they connected in the sentence, but they're connected in the sense. And that just as uh, we have a verb that describes Aaron completing his service and his ministering at the altar, Likewise, uh, his going into the tent of meeting would have to do with some service at the altar, in this case, the altar being the incense altar, and Moses having to teach Aaron that. Davar Acher, we're going to go for another different interpretation, another interpretation. This is lovely. This is a very personal kind of uh, interpretation that we see going on here, uh, dealing with some of the emotions that would have uh, been reflected at a time such as this. And uh, that's one reason why I really love these kinds of comments. Kevan shera'a Aharon, because or since Aaron saw she karvu kol hakorbanot, that all the sacrifices had been offered up, and they performed all the rites, and yet at that moment, the divine presence had not come down and revealed itself to the Israelites at this point, right, in the, in the story. It's only after this that we read about this happening. He was upset. He was concerned. As I said, it's one thing to offer a gift, it's another thing to have the gift received. So, Amar, and he thought to himself, Yodea Ani, I am aware, Shaka'as HaKarosh Baruch Hu Alai, that the Holy One, blessed be He, was angered with me. Uvishvili Lo Yarda Shechina, and because of my own sin in creating the golden calf, is what he's referring to, of course, he says, the divine presence did not alight the Yisrael on the Jewish people. Amar lo le Moshe. He said to Moses, Moshe achi, Moses, my brother, kach asita li. Why did you do something like this to me? Shenichnasti v'nitbayashti. That I went in and I was humiliated. In other words, setting me up for humiliation. How could you do such a thing? Miyad nichnas Moshe imo. And for that reason, Moses went immediately into the tent of meeting with him. Uvakshu rachamim. And they, they supplicated, they pleaded for mercy. Yisrael. And so the divine presence rested on the Jewish people. So it's really going to do a little bit more but there's something so beautiful about trying to understand Aaron's feelings at a time like this. I mean, they were doing something so significant and so publicly and with, with everyone realizing what the results were going to be. And, and in some ways, of course, there are those who say that the tabernacle uh, and, the, and the temple were in some ways supposed to represent uh, Mount Sinai, where God revealed uh, God's presence to the people at Mount Sinai. And this, of course, is reflective of that. And I think this is a good place for me to stop. We'll pick this up tomorrow. There's still some more to be done that is actually, uh, if I can say, charming.
so we'll find Hi. Sure. Yes. How, how is it Moses's? How is it uh, Moses's fault? You know, in setting up Aaron. I, I mean, or why? Why would? Why would he say that? I mean, you know, I don't understand what. I mean, it happened, but but it doesn't. There wasn't anything. I, I don't know. It didn't seem like there was anything overt that in 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 what happened to Aaron that that Moses did specifically. So why would? Why would he, you know, feel that way? Or maybe I'm missing something. It's okay. Okay, so thank you. Appreciate the question. So Aaron was doing this because Moses told him to do it, right? Moses was commanded by God to tell Aaron to do this. And they went through this entire ceremony. And the whole purpose of the ceremony was to bring the divine presence on the Jewish people. And mm -hmm. this had happened. And it's like you're there in order to accomplish something and you're doing it publicly and you don't accomplish it. And it, is a, it, it feels humiliating. And, um, and he was asking Moses, why, why would this, you know, why would you do this? You know, did, did you know ahead of time or did you realize that, that we were taking a big chance here, you know? And of course, Moses was telling Aaron, I can, we can only imagine that when Moses was essentially commanding Aaron to do these things. So uh, this is, I see this as a, a conversation between two brothers. Yeah. You know? Okay. Uh, and, and that when you're, when you're that close to someone, you can share your thoughts. Um, you know, it's not that Mo Aaron was angry. It was just that Aaron felt humiliated. And he was asking Moses, essentially, why we would have done this kind of thing. Okay, that, that makes sense. That makes sense. Thanks. You bet. And of course, we haven't yet gotten to the place, which is far worse than humiliation. Yeah. Uh, did, but very soon. What's the purpose of the tent of meeting? It's it the is, meeting with with the with the God, right? It's, this this is the tabernacle that we're talking about here. Yeah, I know. In another place, there's a reference to a tent of meeting. That's a different tent of meeting. Okay? Yeah, but that's not what we're talking about here. Okay, what we're talking about the 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 little sanctuary that was in the courtyard. Okay, right. Where the and whole only and the only the priest could go in there, and the high priest on Yom Kippur. Only the high priest on Yom Kippur. On Yom Kippur, yes. Right. And apparently Moses, because apparently Moses. Well, okay, okay. So I think that's why there's another tent of meeting where Moses goes in. But then on the other hand, you know, Leviticus starts off with God speaking to Moses, essentially from the, uh, you know, sorry, uh, from the, uh, from the, between the ark, you know what I mean? Because the ark represents the divine throne. Mm-hmm. So the Leviticus starts off with God speaking to Moses from that particular place. So there's, there's some complexity here that, that I'm not real clear about, right? Because we understand that there's this tent of meeting outside of the camp where Moses goes and communes, communes. And then there's another point where God is communicating with Moses from between the, the, you know, the cherubim you know, from the divine throne. It could so, be that those are just two different times, right? Could that, be. That, that, that regarding the, the, um, the laws of sacrifice, regarding the um, installation of Aaron and his sons, God communicated with Moses from this particular place. But regarding other laws and other times, you know, God spoke to Moses when he was in this tent of meeting. But the tent of meeting is sometimes used to refer to the Mishkan itself. It's, it's not real clear. But then sometimes right. I think the ambiguity is intentional. See, I, I'm thinking that this kind of proves that neither one of them sets the fire that we get in the next. In yeah, the next no, they did. That, that I know, I know. It's God's right. fire. It's right. like that's you know, they're the, not that's even anywhere near it. Right. So right. maybe that's a thing too. Like and the fire represents power. Right. 
and transformation and things like that. If they did the incense thing, because if that happened, maybe we're missing that. Maybe somebody like forgot to stick that in there or something. But it, that makes a that makes a great idea because that would be the call down. It's like, okay, we are here. We're you know, you know, we we want to see you. Come on down. You know, it's like we're ready. You know. Yeah, being ready, that's the big question, right? Mm -hmm. Have we have we done the preparation? You know, that or we be believe done. we have done all the preparations yeah. and we are now ready. Right, right. Maybe. Who knows? Well, they, they <laughs> were. I mean, we are going to read how the divine presence alighted. We did. We just uh -huh. read how the divine uh -huh. presence alighted on the on the camp. So Right. Oh, we've got time to say Kadishta Rabbanan. I'm going to stop the recording. And thank you.